Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. In the last episode of The Skeleton Crew, we finally find out more about the mysterious barrier that is hiding the jewel world of Adatin from the rest of the galaxy. This planet apparently has an Old Republic mint on it, which means that this planet used to provide credits, Old Republic credits for the entire galaxy. You understand why they'd want to keep this location hidden. And the technology they use is not only creative, but pretty cool. It's not something we've really seen before in Star Wars. And so today I thought it'd be kind of interesting to look at this barrier and figure out how exactly it works. So at first glance, Atatin looks a lot like a gas giant, which is a brilliant way to hide the planet just there in plain sight. Think Jupiter, but with very greenish looking gas. Even in the Star Wars galaxy with their more advanced starships, flying into the upper layers of a gas giant isn't exactly ideal. This is Ad Atom. It's a toxic maelstrom. Is this right, Chelt? Position's correct, Captain. <laughs> Jupiter is considered an average sized gas giant, it has a mass 318 times that of Earth. This means much more gravitational force, which compresses the many layers of gas in Jupiter's atmosphere, creating more turbulent and dynamic weather patterns. If you happen to be flying through the upper layers of Jupiter, you will find yourself in a very turbulent environment, and sometimes the wind speeds can gust up to 400 miles per hour which is a lot faster than any hurricane here on Earth. Especially if you're unlucky enough to somehow wander into the Great Red Spot, an enormous storm larger in diameter than Earth that has been continuously spinning on Jupiter for hundreds of years. Again, it's probably survivable on most Star Wars starships, but it's not gonna be a comfortable ride. There's really no reason to do this. I'm in the atmosphere. Visibility low. Instruments are at the top. Get some chop. Okay. Yeah, so there's no reason to fly deeper into a gas giant, especially in a manned vessel, because you can easily just send a probe in there to either, you know, scan a planet for science reasons or to survey it for some kind of resource mining operation. The other reason why you're not going to fly into this kind of gas giant is there's no solid layer that you can land on or walk around on. Well, there might be a solid core, but by the time you get to those, uh, that proximity to the core of the planet, the gravity is gonna be so intense, it's gonna crush everything. And so when people see this giant green gas giant, they automatically strike it off of the list for potential locations for that Atten and its treasure. Also take a look at the color of this barrier. It is greenish, and this is also done for a good reason. The color of a gas giant planet indicates the makeup of its atmosphere. And that's because each gas molecule has a certain amount of electrons and that absorbs a certain amount of light when it interacts with it. The more light um, a molecule absorbs, the shorter the wavelength of that light when it's being reflected, and that of course changes the color of light. And the cosmic gas that's most associated with the color green is methane, and also ammonia somewhat. Now it's actually kind of rare to see a regular gas giant in a greenish tint. It does happen, but it's rare, and that's because methane and ammonia need to be placed in extremely cold environments in order to condense into an actual visual cloud layer where they can uh, reflect light. Normal gas giants, because of their mass and proximity to their star, are generally too hot to sustain large amounts of visible methane and ammonia. And so you'll usually only see such colors on a special type of gas giant known as an ice giant. These type of plants only begin to appear once you pass a star system's frost line. The frost line is basically the minimal distance from a star where it's cold enough that you have volatile compounds condense it into clouds. This is why in our solar system, only Neptune and Uranus have these shades of gases in their atmosphere. These type of planets have extremely violent storms on them that are not just driven by the mass of the planets, but also by the difference in temperature between the external heat source in the core of the planet and the just background frigid temperature of this area that is beyond the frost line. Think about cold and hot air mixing here on Earth and creating hurricanes. Similar concept, but at a much larger scale. Neptune, for instance, has high altitude wind speeds exceeding 1100 miles per hour, which can make it very dangerous for even starships with Star Wars levels of technology. Also because methane and most likely hydrogen is involved in the makeup of these types of gas giants, any type of exposure to concentrated amounts of oxygen can create an explosion. So, you know, it's a combustible situation. It's just 
dangerous in many different ways, which is why you wouldn't want to fly into one of these things. So this is Anaton's first layer of defense, a visually dangerous layer of gas that only conceals Anaton's true identity, but also deters spacers from even wanting to get close because you know, pilots are going to be educated about this kind of stuff that I'm telling you. So how do normal gas giants hold so much gas together? You know, why does it just vent out into space? Well, it's because of the planet's tremendous mass and gravitational pull. The strange thing about Ad Atten here is once you get through that gas layer, that barrier, you enter like this large vacuum where the real Ad Atten just floating in space by itself. It's very clear that the real Ad Atten doesn't have enough mass to sustain such a large gas bubble around it. And if it did have that level of gravity, well, Ad Atten must be made out of some crazy material that's super dense that we just don't know about. Um, and yeah, life would definitely not look like that if Ad Atten was that dense. You know, you wouldn't have houses that were two stories or you know, humanoids walking around on two legs, unless they're like super saiyans. I, I don't know. Well, that's where we get to the satellites that we see ringing around the planet that actually create this barrier. We actually have a better view of them in one of the earlier episodes when the kids go to a discovered jewel world known as Ad Akron, which had its barrier completely disabled. I mentioned in a previous video how these satellites remind me a lot of the satellites used in Operation Cinder. Palpatine's Scorch Earth campaign that involved using climate disruption arrays deployed on satellites to create superstorms on targeted planets. I actually think the satellites on Ad Atten are far more complex than even those super weapons were. They seem to have two main functions. One is to maintain the shape of this gas barrier, and this most likely is done with gravity well generator technology. In Star Wars, the scientists have figured out how to make artificial gravity. And so you have things like repulsor lifts, which literally push off of a gravitational field to allow things to levitate. You know, this is how most starships and speeders fly in atmosphere. Then you have something known as the gravity well generator, and this is a you know relatively low mass device that creates a gravitational footprint the size of planets. It's, it's a pretty crazy piece of technology. Now, prior to this, this technology was mostly used by security forces and militaries as interdictor weapons, which can rip ships out of hyperspace travel. See, most hyperdrives in the Star Wars universe have a safety feature where if they detect a large um, mass in front of them in hyperspace, they will pull the ship out so you don't kill yourself. In this case, when you're generating an artificial gravity well, you can pull ships out prematurely. It's a pretty interesting technology. In principle, this same technology could be used to attract gas molecules into a dense enough cloud mimicking a gas giant. Now, where the Old Republic got enough molecules uh, to, to actually create this massive barrier is a whole different question. Maybe they uh, dip the straw into a nearby nebula or something. Now there's another function that these satellites need to fill. Look at the oscillation in these massive platforms. I believe that this is some kind of electromagnetic generator, which creates a sort of magnetic field which prevents solar winds from the local star from stripping the gas from this artificially constructed planetary shell. I mean, this is a pretty elaborate project, all things considered, and this is really something that only a galaxy-wide faction can have the resources to do. It's very impressive. Now, there's a secondary function for these satellites, and this is more about active defense. As you see with someone like Glurb, the pirate, who I will keep reminding audiences was saving up to buy that glowy farm so that he could retire legitimately. Well, Glurb was not deterred by the fearsome presentation of the planet's surface and decides to fly into the maelstrom. It's at this point the barrier's automated weapons system activates what looks like a Tesla coil, and that basically fries Glurb and his ship and his dreams. You see, gas giants like the one that Athanton is trying to mimic typically do have electrical storms that are many times the strength of the ones we see here on Earth because more gas, more mass, more differences in temperature. So once again, we're mimicking the real behavior of gas giants with these satellites and creating a natural cause of death for anyone dumb enough to fly into a green gas giant. Maybe we should send in another. Brutus is pissed off here. I mean, it's clear he thinks that Glurb died because of some natural you know, electrical storm or some kind of turbulence. I really like how they design all this because, you know, the hidden planet trope is used so often in Star Wars. And so 
you kind of get used to every variation of the stroke. You have wandering sentient plants like Sonoma Sikot, which could change systems with a built-in hyperdrive. You have the hidden planet of Alum with its kyber crystals jealously guarded by the Jedi. The hidden unknown regions planet Exegol, which requires a Sith holocron to navigate to. And then you have the planet Peridia, which technically is hidden in another galaxy. But with Anaten, what we're really getting into is planet-wide camouflage. That's really cool. We've never really seen it. And it's very science fiction-y rather than sci-fantasy. Now, the interesting thing is once the kids break through the inner layer of the barrier and make it to this peaceful layer of space that surrounds the real Atatin, we're faced with another problem. See, the density of the gas in this barrier is so thick, there should be very little a light actually getting through this shell. The surface of the planet definitely should not look nearly as bright as it does during the day here. First of all, that light should be greenish, and second, it should be dim, kind of like what the world of Umbara looked like. Remember, Umbara was trapped inside of a nebula. Now, the interesting thing is, if we go back to the scene where the kids see Atatin for the first time, from outer space, there's a very clear light source that is shining very brightly on the planet. It even illuminates the cockpit somewhat. I believe that Atatin is essentially a planet-wide version of the Truman Show. It has an artificial sun, one that's probably powered by a fusion reactor that's placed inside of an electromagnetic field and then placed into orbit of Atatin, or even controlled somewhat by the gravity field generators in the satellites. We know that in Star Wars they have fusion technology, so this is completely believable. Such generators are used to usually power most of the larger pieces of technology from starships to space stations. And an artificial sun wouldn't have to be too large or powerful at these very close ranges to actually light up and warm a planet. Plus the barrier also acts as an insulating layer which preserves heat and also shields the planet from all sorts of nasty things like radiation, pirates, meteorites, and telemarketers. This is why the parents of the skeleton crew have to send that probe into space to communicate with them. The barrier is really the perfect isolation tool. So what happens at night then? You know, if you take a look at the shots of the night sky on Atatin, there are no stars at all. And instead of seeing just black sky at night, you see the barrier and what little light that makes it through from the outside, creating this aurora borealis effect. What does this barrier look like? You see it at night. It's cloudy, like a swirl. You see, they don't really have to work out all these things when they're making a Star Wars movie, but when creative teams do this, when they actually like write out all the rules of how their world functions and try to figure out the science, at least to the best of their extent, I appreciate that because then when you do look into the details, everything kind of makes sense. There's actually uh, real rational reasons why things are made the way they are. And I think this kind of focus on attention and details is what makes the skeleton crew just surprisingly uh, really good. And it seems to outshine a lot of previous uh, content made by Disney because I think there's just maybe a lot of passion in this project. There's out there. These guys are complete nerds. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed uh, our coverage about this barrier. Don't forget to subscribe. Hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. And as usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy. I'll see you next time.